morning or evening or afternoon, depending on your location. Thank you for joining us on episode 54 of the Blowback Roundtable. Uh, we are honored again to have special guest return John Stepling from Norway. And Ian Kummer is a special guest from Moscow. We also have uh, Ben Toth in Hungary, Paige Hungary, and Carlo in Washington, D.C. So thank you all for joining us. Let's start our program just discussing the title is, uh, we called it Navalny and the Space Nukes. That's a throwback to the 80s bands, everybody's favorite synthwave pop band, the Space, no, that's not true. Um, it does sound it's, good it's, for a band, it does. It's, uh, you I know, almost uh, believe apparently, you. <laughs> apparently Navalny um, did somehow uh, not survive uh, when did he pass away? It was pretty recently, right, guys? Uh, in the last 10 or 12 hours. So yes. it's, it's, it's very, very fresh news. It came out from the Russian, uh, what do you call it, prison services, uh, up from there to TASS, to RT, to the Russian media. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, well, I think we should hear from Ian, the Russian perspective of it, because within 11 minutes and 12 minutes, the French, uh, what do you call it, Le Monde magazine and the British Guardian had like multiple page articles about this uh, freedom fighter and, and the, the threat of you know, hugely autocratic uh, Russia that he was supposed to save, you know, democracy from. So I uh, have some headlines and all many, many headlines and many statements from Western leaders lined up. But I want to know, you know, this savior of democracy, the fight against Putin, how was this even, is, is it perceived in Russia? Ian? Yeah. Well, it's one of those, and it's kind of surreal because I remember um, it, it, it got out on Russian, you know, on Telegram, like, oh, Navalny died. And then like, like you said, just a few minutes after that, it hit Western headlines. Now, I, now, a lot of people might find that strange, but I think Navalny dying was a preloaded story. Is one of, he's one of those celebrities that there's already a story written about. Oh, he was murdered. He's brutally murdered oh. by the regime or whatever. So they can just change a few, make some, <laughs> you know, change some details in that template and then click publish. You know, it's it's. Uh, it's happens before um, there's been celebrity deaths that didn't actually happen that were accidentally reported because someone clicked <laughs> um publish when that person wasn't actually dead so that's not unusual very quick um, that's, that's yes true. but what yes. about the russian people i mean i have my take on navalny but <clears throat> i think what, everybody's what is... tired of hearing about him <laughs> and you know really i mean really because he comes up constantly as all you know from external media oh navalny this navalny that i mean he's not like a big person in Russia. He's really not. I mean, you know, because he's not a communist. He's definitely, he was never in any danger of being a communist. That is the second biggest party besides the United Russia. So he's, he's never, I mean, he's a very right wing guy. He's an extremely yeah, that's right wing what I guy. Thought. Yes. He's like a white nationalist. He just, I mean, because he was all, and he was all about Crimea rejoining the motherland. So, you know, if you look at the early things he said, they're definitely not in line with, you know, Western. Um, he did. Like genders. in the early 2000s, he was a fascist. I mean, it's easy for me yes. to say because all of his followers did the the taxi wave, and it was like <laughs> the taxi wave. How do you how do you stomp out cockroaches like you know those disgusting ads? Right. And he was talking about Muslims. He was talking Muslims, about yeah. immigrants. That that was he was, and then the West basically rebranded him in him to this liberal superhero. And also, this is nothing but a fact, no conspiracy theories. He got mRNA vaccinated in Germany, and apparently the Russian initial diagnosis is something of the blood clot. No blood for, clot. further comment on this one. But yeah, he came back from a walk outside the jail. Uh, he collapsed, and the resuscitation was unsuccessful. And that's all we know. There's no forensic investigations or anything like that yet. And I'm glad you pointed that out, Ben, because I was thinking, and I didn't think of it until probably about 10 minutes before the, sh the show started, because it was the blood clot. I'm like, well, he did he ha get, you know, that totally safe, you know, get no um, conspiracy that is never, that has never caused any s negative side effects for anyone ever, that perfectly safe medical procedure. And I wondered if he had that, because it's kind of, it's not a thing that happens often in Russia, because, you know, we have Sputnik. Um, exactly. But he got, That's why I added he got in Germany. <laughs> yes, that's interesting. Um, yeah. So it's what it's one of those, you know, you, and there's going to be accusations of what caused it, right? You know, so it's like, oh, was there foul play? Did he just die? I mean, he's at the age where stuff like that happens, and blood clots are 
major cause of death for, you know, adult males, you know, starting late forties, fifties, sixties. So it's a thing that he could have, he just, he just died. Sometimes people just die. It's a thing that has been known to happen. Sometimes yeah. people just die. Um, uh, you have Spanish fabs. Oh, hey, Spanish fabs talking about, uh, Billy Bob, let's bring something on screen. It's just six seconds. There's no speech in it, but if you, if you've lost a loved one, is this like within 10 to 12 hours of his or her death? Is this how you are? I don't even care about the speech, but she's already at the Munich security conference giving huh. a speech. Yeah. Okay. yeah no, that's pretty interesting. John, you had, uh, prior to, um, going live here, you had uh, an interesting point about how, you know, when they, when they unleash the news so quickly, um, it's always kind of, uh, you know, a kind of suspicious. So it reminds me of, you know, sh and I wasn't alive, but I've heard that, you know, sh very shortly after JFK um, was assassinated, they announced uh, it was a lone gunman. He was, he had no uh, connection yeah. to any kind of organization just a lone gunman and and then of course the investigators themselves on the ground were wondering like how how do they know this like, we're right. we've just we haven't even started but our that's always yeah that's that that's always the 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 tell in a sense they can't wait to rush out the cover story it was true for sirhan sirhan as as well uh uh for martin luther king i mean and and you know obviously 9-11 and, and um, everything associated with that. Uh, no, what's interesting here to me, because I have not followed Navalny's career particularly, but I know that uh, just acquaintances in Norway, since it happened recently and, and people made comments, they their take is immediately, oh, Putin has killed another opposition leader. In yeah. Another opposition leader. Uh, and I said, yeah, what do you, you know, do you know anything about Navalny? And I say this again, because I'm, I'm hardly an expert on this subject. I said, you know, he was profoundly Islamophobic. He was like a white nationalist. He was a very, very far right wing guy. Uh, and, and one would think, had some kind of connection to the CIA because they don't <clears throat> they don't yeah. let those kind of opportunities uh, go to waste uh, and and he he was tailor made for them he was reasonably telegenic and whatnot and and so yeah but mind you know this is a the Western press makes it sound like yeah like he was going to win the next election that he had massive following and and he had like two percent or something one, one to two percent even after the, the so-called fsb so-called botched the the poisoning you remember that that's when he actually yeah. became uh, center stage before that he was nobody and afterwards he's nobody i love that they they do call him opposition leader which is just gennady zyuganov the communist party leader that is the yeah. opposition in russia not this guy but sorry yeah yeah, it, for some it's, reason Putin never actually harms the actual opposition that he has. Like no. the the actual communist opposition that he has, they're all fine, which is weird. Um, if he's such you a know, you know he, such an undemocratic thug, but um, you know, well, Navalny, uh, just oh, as a sidebar remark, and file yeah. this under to be taken up later or another day or something. That all the African leaders that rejected the vaccine um, have died, right? I've like seen a compilation of this, really of scary. It's very strange. It's a very strange story. And, and um, it's, I haven't dug into it yet, but somebody sent me an article on it. And I thought, well, that's, that's you know, reasonably strange. Uh, and and uh, but so I'm just throwing that out there as, as yeah yeah we don't want to dwell on this but death and uh, um, John you might have seen if not I recommend Nicola Maduro from Venezuela who also had a comment uh, about uh, thank God we got this kind of vaccine and not the other kind we got it from Russia and Cuba it's just the thought yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and you want to I I do remember back in, with the Kennedy assassination. A uh, a foreign newspaper 
published uh, his assassination before it occurred because they confused the timeline between the the uh, uh, the United States and uh, and uh, and their country. And uh, but uh, but to go out, I'll go out on a limb, but not a very. I don't think it's very critical. It's, it's interesting to me that Putin has this enormous PR success, three hundred million views on the interview with Carlson. That's just X, and that's just the English interview. Uh, right. Margarita Simonian, the RT editor, says close, close to a billion if you take all the uploads and the translations. So, and, and if yeah. you and if you also factor in, there's more than one set of eyes watching the interview. Or oh, it's, yeah. it's much higher. Yeah. And then, and then uh, that this ship is sunk in in the Black Sea. That doesn't make any because people now, people like us, are aware that the, the the Ukrainians didn't sink that ship. The CIA and MI6 sank that ship, and and their Confederates. Yeah, there was uh, a global spinning around above the right. Black Sea again. Um, so it's very, it's very a very convenient deck because it's taken the attention away from. The, this huge PR success that Putin had. I mean, what he got under people's eyes was the truth about about Ukraine. And and uh, well, you know. I, I I just want to quick make a because this came up the other day and it may have come up on on the Aesthetic Resistance podcast. But uh, if if you go to the BBC, the New York Times, Slate. The Independent, I mean Washington Post. You can find op-eds about Hello, Dr. Carlson's interview with Putin, and they are they are they could have been written by the same you know chat box actually. Um, just adjectives like vile and disgusting were used. This is an utterly innocuous interview in many ways. I mean. Putin was articulate and dignified and statesmanlike and charming. Um, and Tucker Carlson was Tucker Carlson. Um, but, but you know, Carlson is an interesting discussion onto himself. But, but vile and disgusting, it was not. And uh, uh, it, it fascinates me that you have to dig very hard uh, to find the material that the the South African case contained uh, against Israel, the incitement to genocide part of that that brief uh, contains all these quotes by Israeli politicians and rabbis and settler officials and dignitary. Oh yes, and yes. I, yeah, I mean, I read some of them on the podcast. Um, the other day, because, you know, it's not hard to prove incitement to genocide when you read this stuff. Uh, it, it's, I maybe I can dig it up quickly in a few minutes and, and read a few of them, uh, because people find it hard to believe that this was actually what, like, Moisha Faglin, Yov Gallant, and Ben Gavir, and all these people did. Oh, yeah, that's astounding stuff. Arabs are like monkeys and should be, you know, uh, driven into the sea. Their children are terrorists and little snakes and should be beheaded like the parents. I have no sympathy for the children or the adults. I want them all dead. There's, these are politicians saying this, not crazy people off the street or something. These are elected officials. John, There's not a single word about this in the Western press. Yeah, not it's amazing. a single word. It's amazing. Yeah. Imagine, uh, imagine Hezbollah or Hamas, you know, leader saying something like that. Like everybody would hear of it within a minute. I have to tell you a very quick, short, again, sidebar, parenthetical comment. I have friends in in Hollywood who work in television, and I. The new season is starting. It was delayed because of the strike. And I, a friend of mine is on this Dick Wolf show. Um, it, it doesn't matter. And the first episode, a bomb goes off in a Somali restaurant or something. And they're blaming the Somalian terrorist group. So the officials, the FBI and the Homeland Security are all huddled together. And the guy goes, what do we know about these Somalians? 
Oh, they're called Abdul Abdul something something. The guy goes, I've never heard of them. He goes, Yes, they're a, they're a horrible, hyper violent terrorist cell, same ideology as Hamas. In Somalia, <laughs> yes, yeah. This Again, is the uh, this is the new screenwriters. Uh, you know, just uh, subtly, subtly, not so subtly, indoctrinating you know Americans into you know Hamas is the new ISIS. Yeah, right. I, I don't I mean, know if this, the screenwriters you know, guild has stopped striking. It might just be Chat GPT, but yeah. Well, if you look at yeah. CNN, CNN's uh, parent company, Warner Brothers, is owned by a Zionist, and it's come out. And actually, this has come out from the CNN's own staff, their own staff members who are upset about this, that they have to go through a special approval process. Basically, everything they write, and no, not just basically everything they write has to be approved by the Israeli government before they even publish it. There's a special well, approval process for yeah. When I worked in Hollywood on TV shows as a, as a staff writer, everything had to be approved by standards and practices. Originally, that meant you couldn't show erect. Right, but this is the news. This is but the now, news. Then, it's CNN. Then for God's there sake. Was like, <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, no, then there was a, a liaison to the army, to the military, official mm -hmm. and then uh people would come and sit in on story conferences occasionally from the cia or retired homeland security guys now because i'm not there anymore but i know writers it's just mocking the media every staff for any show that has to do with the military or the police or spying espionage anything has an official from the cia or fbi on the staff sitting in helping with the writing of the script. So literally, those people are writing Hollywood film and TV now, quite literally. Well, I want to say to people who might think they're separate, when you know, John says Hollywood, always include big AAA games in that as well. Because the way, you know, Call of Duty and all that, you kill the bad Russians, the bad Venezuelans, it has the same fingerprints as any big sort of Absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, it's amazing. It's amazing. And yeah, news and... <laughs> News and entertainment are the are the same thing. It's all it's all blurred so, into the other the other aspect of our title was about the space nukes, and that's an interesting story. I don't know if we can call that a distraction. What do you guys think about the space nukes? Um, I mean, to me, it seems just like something the evil Russians would do, right? Like, I mean, it just makes sense. That if anybody's going to create space nukes and threaten humanity, it's something Putin would do. So, Larry, do you guys agree with that? I mean, that's basically, I mean, who could argue with that, guys? Can I? Because this thing, uh, the very terrifying uh, threat uh, in space, it's almost reused, uh, like with the same content from 2018 and 2020. And I watched a short clip from Larry Johnson, former CIA, and said, absolutely, it's scare hype. That's all that it is. But remember, this was when the, uh, it's not the Senate, what do you call it, guys call it? The House? The other the part House of, of yeah, the House. House. Yeah, yes. they were voting on this big uh, 90 something billion, 60 billion for Ukraine bill. And in the middle of that, it came from some Democratic representative saying big, big, scary existential threat. And it went everywhere. Like then it soon became nukes in space. Then it became anti-satellite weapons. And it just, just skittled through the Western media. Be very afraid. And it didn't work. The, the House went into recess uh, until the, the end of yep. this month, I think, uh, uh, without Ukraine aid. But that was the second part of, you know, that didn't. I mean, we were heading into the Munich Security Conference, right? And Navalny's dead and there's space nukes. Uh, that's kind of where we got the title. Uh, thoughts yeah. thoughts on the space nukes, guys? It's the plot well, to I... GoldenEye. You've seen GoldenEye. The yeah. James Bond movie. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, the 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 propaganda now being coming let's stick, out. Let's of, stick with the propaganda. Yeah. Go on, John. Yeah. And no, it, it it has become more strident and and sort of desperate feeling. Uh people like John Kirby and and all the all the White House press. Mm representatives that they're more cornered aren't they yeah and they they they're 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 snappier and and more defensive and 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 C curry jean-pierre 
sorry but she walks yeah, in that's and name. gets it gets two negative questions and closes the book and says we're done you know yeah she's supposed yeah. to her job is supposed to answer those questions and she said no but they're unanswerable i mean they're actually getting a few real questions now and um but you know this is this is uh everything somehow uh circles back to 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 israel right now because this is this is the it it overlaps with every story that that comes up it seems and um uh and 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 the violence is worse and more horrific than it's possible to invent or imagine uh and and so the u.s government and seems they have to work harder and harder and harder to bury all these things you know images of blindfolded prisoners shot while they were told to run away the body of the girl on the fence with her legs blown ripped. off yes um yeah ripped off uh it, it, it's, it's there, yeah. another hospital where are they the uh, nasa hospital now. NASA, yeah yeah, yeah. And um, the the uh, one of the, there's a really great article by Thierry Masson, um that that I've posted a number of places and it was mentioned in the podcast. Um, aesthetic resistance podcast, uh, where he hit, he kind of clocks the history of um, of uh, Israeli violence going back to the Ergun and Stern gang and pre Nakba, pre 48, that the first wave of, uh, uh, of, of Zionists came on, they were already killing people, wholesale violence. And it goes up to the bombing of the King David Hotel and so forth. The point being that, that it, it, it tracks this all the way up to this rabbi uh, Sharboff, Sharboff, um, who was sentenced to life imprisonment in '84 for um, terrorist attacks against Palestinians, and it must have been horrific. I don't remember the details, and I've not looked it up. But he was sentenced to life in prison. Now Yitzhak Shamir commuted that sentence five years, six years later. Very quietly and and uh and he's now free so there was this giant conference in jerusalem victory for israel it was a big like settlers rights conference one of those convention center you know um back slapping uh self-congratulatory orgies and this rabbi who life sentence was commuted sharbuff i have to look up his exact name i apologize uh, got the the longest standing ovation of anybody, and Netanyahu was in the audience, standing and applauding. And Ben, are you still alive? Was... He's still alive, John. Yeah, yeah. And and you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up because I have it here. So oh, I remember uh, on your yeah your aesthetic resistance podcast, uh, you had all these very very inflammatory statements from these religious leaders, from these politicians, and it's just yeah. shocking. Why are you um, looking yeah, at the, the mainstream media won't touch them with the 10 foot pole? No, no. Why are you looking and, up? I, I can't be precise either, but I saw some officials say that anybody above four years of age is like fair game uh, to kill. That's one disturbing fact. And something like 60 percent of the Israeli public believes that they haven't been forceful enough uh, in, in Gaza. That's what terrifies me, because that means yeah. this is why this is not just the leadership. You know, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh let me see if i can if i can find this um uh oh my goodness probably i can't because i'm terrible <laughs> um see you but, too, well, let, i'll read you i'll put on my reading glasses in fact and let me just read you a couple of the the, the sentences that the quotes um rabbi eli ben dahan who is the deputy minister for religious affairs said a Jew always has a much higher soul than a Gentile, even if he's gay. You don't hear that. It sounds Talmudic, to be uh, honest. Talmudic rabbi logic. Dov Lior, the chief rabbi of all the settlements, Hebron, um, others, 
uh, said, Gentile sperm leads to barbaric offspring. Uh, but the best one was uh, Ovida Yosef, uh, who actually has died now, He, but very recently. He was part of the, the Shas party. He said, Goyim, non-Jews, were born only to serve us. Without that, they have no place in the world, only to serve the people of Israel. Why are Gentiles needed? They will work. They will plow. They will reap. We will sit like a Fendi and eat. With Gentiles, it will be like any person. They need to die, but God will give them longevity. Why? Imagine the once donkey would die. They'd lose their money. This is his servant. That's why he gets a long life, to work well for the Jews. It goes on and on. Definitely on. Talmudic, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, this stuff can't be touched, but... yeah. It goes on and on and on. I have like three pages of these things, these comments. So the, the point of the Thierry Maison, the reason I brought it up is that, is that it makes very clear this was the sensibility from the start of Zionism. It was a violent, uh, force-based colonial enterprise from the yeah. beginning. Uh, ben Gurion made no bones about it. We will have to use aggression because it's their land and we're stealing it. He said that. Um, uh, he, you know, he also said that you know God gave them the right to steal it. But the point being that that violence is baked into this into this enterprise, and um, and that, that this settler sensibility was there from the start. Anyway. And the propaganda, I mean, the ideology of Zionism, it was justified. And a lot of the propaganda in the background doing the justification was just as you described. So it was number one, you know, the non-Jewish humans can't be trusted. And they have a whole history, you know, hundreds of years of history to point to and say, look, they don't treat us right. We have to have our own state. And so... So, you know, this is this is upheld. This this false notion of racial differences was upheld through this propaganda saying, you know, um, we can't trust non-Jewish people. And, hey, Jewish people are better anyway. We're just you know, we're, rac we're racially add, superior. Add, add to that the philosophy that this state has to grow. The Ersatz Israel always has to get larger and yeah. larger at the expense of other people's land. Well, yeah. this is happening because... Of course, the USA is providing the arms to do it. Israel does not have the means to wage oh. this kind of warfare without them. I mean, if, I mean, Biden himself is a vegetable, but um, who is his second? Ian, who's his... a Politico headline. U.S. won't punish Israel for Rafa, oper Rafa operation. That doesn't protect civilians. Sources, you know, uh, those an anonymous sources. We, we, we won't punish them. It's basically enabled. Sorry, go ahead, Ian. Well... Well, who's the Secretary of State? A Zionist. Who's our Treasurer? A Zionist. Who's right. Kamala Harris's husband? A Zionist. I mean, yeah, no, we really be surprised? Majority, <laughs> can we be yeah, surprised? The majority of the cabinet have dual citizenship, are, are Zionists. Um, and it, it, it bears mentioning again that uh, for all the scolding and finger pointing from the Saudis and, and the UAE and uh, Turkey and all, they all of those anything. countries are helping Israel get weapons and food and supplies. Yes, they are. Yeah, all of them. Their people, so, their people have very changed attitudes, but the, the leadership, you're quite right. They're, they're enablers as well, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's not it's not just people who identify as Jewish that are Zionists, right? Biden says he's a Zionist. Um, there's a lot of Christian Zionists. A lot of the right wing Republicans are pro-Zionist because of their diluted Christianity, you know, that claims Israel fulfilled Bible prophecy in 1949. And we've got to support Israel if we're going to get God's support as a nation. Like, I don't know if they believe that, but a lot of their yes. constituents certainly when I was, believe that. Yes. When I was a kid in church and we'd have the kids Sunday school, you know, I remember, I remember a particular, um, you went class. To we had, no, 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 no. Sunday school. I'm sorry. This is where you go to church and the kids go off. They don't sit in the pews. The younger kids have a separate youth teacher and they have a separate sermon yeah, in I'm, Baptist churches in USA. But, um, and there's one, 
So even starting at a young age, they talk about Zionism. There's no Israel. That's where the final battle between good and evil is going to happen. That's why we have to support Israel. Um, Javier remember, Millet comes to I remember mind. for some reason, I remember this one particular sermon from our youth teacher, we had our youth pastor that we had. And, and the Chinese were there for some reason. They'd sent, he mentioned, you know, China will probably be there with a million man army to <laughs> help the Arabs. It was very, it's quite um, a mental. Well, image, you know, but... Mike Pompeo, Mike Pompeo is a yeah. dominionist Christian yep. and is a, you know, a believer in uh, a the rapture. He's a pretty good dancer as well. Pretty good dancer. Yeah, and he a danced. Pretty yeah. good dancer, you say. Yeah. So he's a he's a he's a rabid Zionist because it's part of the whole architecture. He did lose no, some weight. Ten that's seconds good. is more than enough for that. But yeah, that's a couple of kilometers away from Gaza. Okay. <clears throat> that's Porky Mike Pompeo, former CIA director and a Secretary of State. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's the Battle of Megiddo. It's apocalyptic. It's the end of the world. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's really, from my perspective, as crazy as it gets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, everybody can be sacrificed. Everybody's uh, up for grabs. I think it was early in, in this week, but the first thing that came into my mind was a headline from uh, Javier Milei, the new Argentine asshole, who oh, went geez. straight from the wailing wall, you know, crying uncontrollably to the yeah. Pope and brought him biscuits. And apparently he made a statement that he wants to tear down um, what he called the Al-Aqsa Mosque to, to build the temple and bring about the Messiah. That's the level of his absolute, I, I, I mean, this How was... How the fuck did he get elected, you know? I think many Argentinians are asking themselves. I just, that was just the last Hail Mary when every other candidate up to that point has failed. It's kind of... Yeah, I guess. It's I, yeah, going I to guess. pieces. They've been hammered so hard by the IMF and the World Bank for decades. I, I think so many people were actually living in poverty in Argentina that uh, that anybody anybody could uh, be elected. I mean, we have yeah, Trump now. Welcome to triple that <laughs> poverty. Basically. Yeah. We have a new. We have a new. Uh, we have a new Marcos in the Philippines. It's it's just absurd the way international politics has gone. That's true. And this also means, a new uh, Sukarno, yeah. Sukarno or Sukarno, I was going to get them mixed up in Indonesia. Right. Yeah. A new Sukarno, yeah. Human rights abuse guy. Yeah, What's his general name? And political family. Uh... Yeah. Well, I, I, I ask a question here because this comes up. Uh, I see this a lot in social media, and I've mentioned it on our podcast a few times this conflation of communism and fascism and that the right wing in America in particular, uh, the sort of MAGA guys, but just in general, the far right um, disenfranchised working class, uh, imagine that the World Economic Forum represents world- Marxism, yeah. Well, I can explain that actually. So it's kind of it is, and it, you know, it, it's a it's double genocide theory. I think is the most concrete origin of the fascism and communism are the same thing. And it started ironically with Hitler himself, because you know he painted the Soviet Union as the aggressor. That's that Germany right. had to attack do a preemptive strike because the judo Bolsheviks. The, the judo Bolsheviks had committed. A genocide and of course that's also where the whole Holdemore myth start that you know there's this deliberate right. jewish controlled genocide of people and they were going to spread to western europe unless the defender of europe germany stops them first and so then that got turned into double genocide theory in the 1990s how the communist yeah, genocide was the that. same if not worse by and, the way the the term uh, red, red brown alliance that actually comes from the 1990s uh moscow it comes from I think Gorbachev, but it might have been the drunk afterwards, might have been Yeltsin when he burned the parliament, right? That was Yeltsin. Well, I yeah. Because the old communists and the new nationalists were kind of, we don't want you guy. We, we actually want to keep the Soviet Union. That's where it came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I asked this, I brought it up because I, I it's like this conundrum. It's this, this um, really perplexing question because 
you find yourself the same right wing people that think Klaus Schwab is a communist um, are very good about Iran. They support Palestine. They support the farmers' protests in they Europe. Do. A lot of them say "fuck Ukraine" as well. Anyone, yeah. And your educated white liberal who knows the difference often and been, you know, been going to university. They are uh, worse. They don't. They're they're. Um, you That's know, the lesson. The last two years of my life. So yeah, it's so the, it's very confusing. One finds oneself aligned with with people you don't necessarily want to be aligned with in some ways, and yet, you know, we're your enemy is my enemy, whatever. Um, and and I'm going to respond to dust later. It, no, it's just very strange, and and um, uh, it it speaks to. I mean, I've written a number of blog posts that, on this and on my blog, but it. it it, it firstly represents something about the collapse of public education in the West. And, um, you, you know, you, you don't, you, it's very easy to find studies and examples of what has happened, that people's vocabularies have shrunk. They know far fewer words than 50 years ago. Something like 70% of high school students don't know how to write cursively. And actually, I don't can't know if they know how to read. Period. There's a lot of just yeah, Thank you. By the way, quickly add: there's Dmitry Polyansky, who is the sub, uh, the the second uh, UN uh, appointee of Russia, right? Uh, vice, uh, you know, ambassador to Russia, and he said uh, somebody asked the question: Why don't you answer with the old classics? Because you used to use Shakespeare and Dostoevsky and all that. And he said, Well, the discourse with the West has gotten so primitive. He uses this word that we we simplify it just to get the message across. I mean, doesn't that just underline your point? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, but it's, I, I mean, yeah. The, the presidential debates are like use fourth grade vocabulary. They're, they yeah. maybe so even before it's, Trump, it's, they did. It's a super interesting topic that I'm thinking about a lot all the time because I'm trying to you know like try and help people to have a correct perspective have a correct understanding about things and i've noticed that you know people are divided into you know embracing so many different narratives so like you spoke to the liberals you know the liberals know the difference between fascism and communism but then the people that are aligned with us on you know on the ukraine issue on the israel issue um you know they're the ones that kind of see uh, fascism and communism as the same thing and they see you know biden as a marxist you know um no, but, let me add. You you brought up the point, John, on your podcast that you know a, one good paradigm is to say that you know communism is anti-fascism and fascism is anti-communism, and I, I like that. That's that's helpful and useful, and I would agree with that. Putin um, made that but, same but point. You gotta you gotta understand that to understand any of that, you've got to understand the reality of class and class struggle and how yes. class dynamics yes. drive, um, you know, drive events and drive strategies, drive policies. If you don't understand class, then and they don't, because class is what's ignored and completely erased from everybody's brain. You know, they're thinking in liberal liberal terms like nationalism. They don't realize that there's a nationalism of the bourgeoisie. Then there's a nationalism of the proletariat, which is entirely different, um, with different agendas and different, um, you know, different interests. Yeah, but, no, people, people. That's absolutely true, and and I've said that others, many others, have said that 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 that's that idea was was consciously, intentionally erased from Western discourse. Class, it just it's just gone, and and then like Fox News and the far right propagandists and you know everybody like Bill Crystal to whoever. Uh, started employing it as a as a offhand pejorative oh class warfare <laughs> yeah you're one of those okay and so it just became a radioactive term radioactive idea you can't you can't use it and it's so crucial to understanding yeah, well, absolutely fundamental anything. do you know uh, just to, just to add a quick uh, european flavor to uh, this uh, i've seen a lot of exclusively Western European, French, German accounts saying, look, the farmers are fighting climate communism. They, unironically, without thing, that's what they're fighting. Whereas Eastern Europe, we, we only had this propaganda for about 30 years. 
and and we say oh we're standing up to climate fascism you know we, we kind of remember a little bit more uh, but yeah. it, it's, it's it's like the the divide still exists so it, it becomes a clearer picture if you um if you consider uh uh um a libertarianism libertarians uh because what the general population the red state population is is essentially expounding is is uh Lyndon LaRouche the way I remember him yep and uh that's a great, great with all, all the racism that's in there that was in in you he, he would be on camp he would have people on campus when I was at university yes but yes it, He's still, I mean, those people are still around. Yes, way. and he yeah. and they would be against the war, but if you delved any closer, they were anti-immigration. They're just like now. It's a, yeah. and uh, and I think that's that's had a, uh, I don't want to call it insidious, but that's had an effect on people, uh, uh, in the in the red states, uh, and uh, and and it explains their position. Their position. That's that's as far as I want to take it. But it explains a lot about their positions on on all kinds of policy. So, well, you know, I, th I think that's an incredibly great point, and I'm really glad you mentioned it because I often forget that that Larouche and his people are still out. I guess Larouche is dead, but that the Laroucheites are still out. They publish papers. They never use their name, and uh, and you. You often get, if you'll be reading an article and you'll get this funny, like, um, almost like uncanny thing and go, what's wrong with this piece? You know, <laughs> I know what it's, you're talking about. it seems okay, but, but yeah. I mean, you know, and invariably, if you look it up, it's, it's LaRouche. It's LaRouche's people. <laughs> I like there's more nuance there. There's more than one LaRouche group, and I make differences between them. There, there, there's this and that. But I'm wondering when we talk about propaganda, if we can sort of. I know, John, that uh, for you, it's mostly connected to Israel and Gaza, which is true, but let's not forget there's also another theater uh, going on right now, which is Ukraine, where the Abdeyevka settlement, all the Western red lines are all, were really losing. And for that, it looks like it was also a good. Um, I guess, uh, cover to have the Navalny th stuff, um, the space nukes. And two little interview follow-ups I want to talk about. One was Putin had a little interview with uh, Zarubin, uh, and he said, all this Nazi propaganda, we should have a worldwide stuff, um, stuff, uh, struggle against it. Obviously, no one's going to buy that because he said all the Western countries view the world with, through this supremacist lens, which is exactly how that began. You know, he's Absolutely. not just talking about Nazi Germany anymore or Israel. Well, I think Netanyahu warned Iran, uh, warned Putin that Iran is it wants to kill another. I don't know how many million Jews, which is ridiculous. But he also regretted. And I really I, I, this should have been part of the Tucker interview, uh, not starting the SMO in 2014 and trusting the West. And then uh, this is like 4D chess. He was disappointed in Tucker because he didn't ask really tough questions. So he could he could give tough answers, which was great. And then he said this is like the, the KGB um, officer that he once was that he prefers Biden over Trump because, you know, he's more predictable, which which I really like. That's just playing yeah. with the minds of. Uh, the Western propaganda while, and people may have seen the short Tucker follow-ups uh, since then. He's fallen in love with Russian McDonald's. He went yeah. to a Russian Oshan, like a supermarket, say, look, it's $100, not $400. Then he went to the Kievskaya Moscow station. And that's the Stalin era, absolutely beautiful, and, and, and fell in love with that. And that's why I wanted to quickly respond to Tucker that, yeah, he was an anti-China whore. But when he was asked what his worldview is, he said it's simple. It changes with the facts. And the Chinese people, the pro-China people, were outraged that this interview was taking place. Afterwards, they say, that was awesome. Bring him to China. They launched petitions. Come to China next. We want to show you Guangzhou. We want to show you this metro. So, you know, he's capable of change. And I, I think I feel vindicated that I uh, said that. But yeah, it, I, I think wanna, it all... I want to get to, uh, you know, Ian, really Ian um, visited this uh, NATO war I... trophy park in, in Moscow. And I want to get to that. But I did before that. I do want to discuss this issue that Ben just raised because I kind of see it dividing. You know, the normal the normal people I hang out with on Facebook. There's this division about uh, regarding Carlson, and so half of them are attacking Carlson as don't trust him, like it's all part of a plan. And 
he's not authentic, right? And then some people are are saying like, well, I mean, maybe he's authentic, maybe he's not, but what does it really matter? I mean, the fact is he's saying and doing things that, you know, that are beneficial, that are are helping people to move in the right direction. And I don't know, what do you guys think about that? Because I can kind of see both sides. Um, it's, it's a, yeah. it, this is a great question. And uh, it came, the same question came up when Oliver Stone did his two films on Ukraine. Yeah. Is he an asset? Is he? Yeah. Is, you know, and, and I said, I think the films are great. You know, are, is, is this the voice of, you know, Che Guevara? No, it's Oliver Stone, but he's radicalized himself to some extent. And I don't, I, this are like these are like training wheel documentaries, you know. But when you eventually you'll ride the bicycle without any help. Uh, I don't. I think it's all good. The same thing came up with Russell Brand, and people would say, "Oh, but you know, he was married to Katy Perry." I said, "Look, you know, don't beat guys up for bad choices in marriage, um, because I would be punished forever." But uh, you know. Brand has he woken up and he's done a lot of good things and he still makes tons of missteps and and he's seduced by certain you know figures in power and stuff but he's also done some great things um, had some great interviews so so the, I'm kind of uh, with Ben on on the Tucker Carlson thing I said you know look if if he, it, to say that Tucker Carlson is not a great intellectual and that he's a product of, of you know, the spectacle and... and the that's what's life. awesome about him. He's an everyman, John. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's what know, makes him powerful. That, But, I mean, if you have to... That's obvious. That's a given that he's not... You know, he comes from privilege of, of a Republican family, I believe. And, well, CIA I daddy. There's what? CIA daddy, uh, Voice of yeah. America editor. He was he bragged that he was in Moscow in the 1980s and like every second building had power. I don't know how the fuck they did Olympics that way, but that's that was that was the propaganda then. Yeah, I mean, I it's it's I didn't expect much from the interview. I was pleased that don't Americans, this. however many million have watched this, got exposed to uh, Putin in a different light. I think that's great it's all to the good um how much good I, you know i don't know but i don't see anything negative about it and i think that those people who i read on social media or i talk to in person here who say oh you know tucker carson it's all a big you know this kind of reflexive cynicism um i find really tedious and just too easy and those people eventually end up being cynical about everything. Um, and that's, that's the fact. My favorite Adorno quotes is cynicism yeah. is just another mode of conformity. Um, I, I know that it's a hashtag cancel culture, but it is an attempt to cancel his voice. And there's this massive wall of propaganda, everything beyond it is deep, dark Soviet Russia. And he pierced a hole right through that wall. And for that, I can only, you know, applaud him. And that's why the, a lot of Chinese people are saying, look, you really have to come to China. I have to show you. And getting back to NATO, I was getting there, but too slowly. Sorry about that. Because this whole thing, you know, the Avdivka collapse, he got no uh, Zelensky. And even the foreign secretary of Britain said, please, please, uh, US, you have to sign this 60 billion because we're having uh, problems. NATO is in a panic, but... Um, I had more to say, but you know what? Since it's already shared, Ian did a huge tour. Well, of... yeah, I'm, my bad. I, I you know, I... <laughs> I'm just going to piano through it. Uh, because well, these... so the big thing here is, and I want to tie this in with the new news, that this vote is just going to be delayed. Because I was wondering about that, because earlier I was, I mean, I've been saying this since December, that basically, um, oh, don't scroll through just yet, just leave it. I'm going back to the top. Uh, yeah, Sorry. thanks. Uh, no, no, you're good. Um, the big thing is that uh, I mean, I was predicting. You know, I was just like, okay, in the next couple of weeks, there's going, they're going to get the next aid package. There's no way they're not going to get the aid package to Ukraine. Here we are, mid February. You know, a month and a half after I said that, and 
they're pushing it to the end of the month at least. Yeah, I'm surprised so, too. I'm surprised as well, Ian. NAFO so, and the Ukraine accounts are labeling whoever the speaker is, Johnson or something. Johnson, who, yes. As he's, he's a traitor. He's a Vatnik. He's a Vatnik. He's a Vatnik. Um, I'm glad a traitor to the US, Very to Ukraine. Surprised. But yeah, so if you want to bring up the slideshow, you're okay. going to tie that in. So this is, so this first one here, so this is medical. This is first aid stuff. You have combat guys, you have all these. Looks familiar. Uh, tourniquets, yes. So it should be familiar because this is stuff we get. Um, and then you can go to the next one. The big thing is that I want to emphasize it, um, it's just in how much trouble they are because everything, I mean, not everything because Ukraine does make some of their own stuff. They do have that, some of that Soviet era manufacturing capability, but like, like everything from, you know, boots to first aid kits to um, radios, everything is just, you know, vehicles is just, so that's a British uh, medevac vehicle. There's a stretcher. You can see more. Almost everything in this picture is NATO of NATO origin. Go to the next one. Um, American Humvee uh, with the turret. I like yes. that they put flags on it, like where the where the trophy. Yes, are. that was helpful because you know people aren't necessarily going to get that. And there's the AT, good old AT4. Um, then there's some mines. Again, some of it, Ukraine does make some of their own stuff, and they do. I've labeled with the flags, the stuff that is made in there. So this is so there's a big, long, large section about uh, mine warfare Austria? in here. Um, I think this is yes. I think that's yes, Austria. Austria. Yeah. It is Austria. Austria. Yeah. Yeah. Austria. Wow. Yeah. So you've yeah. got a, a neutral bit of, country who insists yes. we're not part of this conflict. Yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, so, the, so the big thing is that in radio. So that's a. I'd say that's a, one of the biggest contributions. Which, both which sides. One of those is the Starlink. Um, you know what? I did actually get picked. They did have a Starlink display. I forgot to actually share those pictures, but there was a star. There was, in fact, a Starlink display. I don't think they actually stole a Starlink satellite. They had a mock up of what, what the satellite looks like. Had the um, the display screen. They had a mannequin with it. Um, I unfortunately forgot to share that picture, but um, it was in the same section as the communications equipment. Because the big thing is that when you're in a military conflict, you don't want unencrypted plain text communications with each other. I mean, both sides did it a lot, especially near the beginning, especially the Donbass militias and the Ukrainian side, because they just didn't have enough military grade communications gear to go on. And NATO really filled the gaps in that. Um, a lot of these I recognize, these are just your pretty standard Harris um, radios. You can go to the next one. There's several of these uh, pictures of these communications equipment. There's one particular picture I want to go to. Um, okay. Just moving on. Keep going. Um, see radios, radios, radios. China Is and stop. Wait, go. Uh, yes, yes. So oh. there are some. So there's some Chinese drones, Chinese radio equipment, commercial type stuff that you can buy from China. And there was actually quite a bit of it. And this was the one I wanted. So this is this is a Blue Force tracker. So. Um, it's a situational awareness tool. So you, if your vehicle, it's too big for a person to carry, but if your, your vehicles have it and you can, it's GPS, it's on the GPS network. So you can see where you are and where all of your other vehicles and adjacent units are. Um, the big thing is just from looking at this museum, it's clear that um, before the, um, the special military operation started and in the early stages of it, NATO is really envisioning Ukraine, the Ukrainian war effort being this kind of irregular light infantry centric, um, like star Robert, like Robert Highland starship troopers, basically, ah, is yes. be. you know, they're very big on that being the model of a modern war. And it's so completely off. You'll notice that heavy equipment that was actually useful. They, I mean, the Ukraine really shifted back to a Soviet style method. Oh, there's fighting. more pictures. No, oh, that's a yeah, different I, topic. I wanted Ian to uh, okay. sort of. But yes, the um, and you can really see that from the early shipments. That's I think an that's interesting all the point. That's an interesting they point. Because they were envisioning, oh, it's going to be guerrilla warfare, irregular warfare, hit and run tactics, and that just had no basis in reality. And I think that's because NATO's just not had a real conflict in so long. They had this whole idea that was so completely divorced from reality. That just does not work. You need all that old stuff. You need those tanks. You need those big artillery barrages. You can't. And I think 
that really hurt them, you know, doctrinally because um, the big one, and I heard all, I read all these NATO, you know, cheerleaders talking about this. So you have on-call artillery, you know, every Ukrainian soldier can call in an artillery strike. Well, you know, that works in Afghanistan when um, you're fighting guys in sandals and there's not a lot of um, competition for your limited resources. But when you're in a situation like Ukraine, where everybody's just where there's so many targets, you're firing thousands and thousands of shells. You can't have every Joe calling in artillery strikes. It doesn't work. So they really had to go back to a more centralized fire planning approach. And that, so, and the problem is that the command staff, you know, anything at a brigade or higher, I mean, that takes years to train. I mean, not just training individual soldiers, but training your command teams takes okay, command staff years, is, years, yeah, yeah. takes years. And they, and they hadn't, they had to start from scratch after that war already started. I think that really hurt them. And you see, and I don't think, and honestly, looking back, I don't think NATO themselves realized there was a problem until after the counteroffensive failed, after that 2023 yeah. offensive. So, you I mean, a year and a half into it, they had they didn't even realize there was a problem with how they were approaching it until they had that failure. But if we can go back to the pictures, there were a few others I wanted to point out here. Yeah. Uh, um, do you want to? I uh, Well, right. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. What was the question? I know I had some different topics in mind, but I'll get back to the pictures. He, he had thrown yeah, up some different photos. But right, this yeah, is where we were. A, yeah. 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 And go, yeah. There's nothing. There's a couple little points I want to point out. So there's, of course, you know, you've got your javelins and your big, you know, that was going to be the game changer. And that's, again, this that infantry centric approach because that was the javelin was the only thing they were talking about for a while. Look, I remember the, big, the Western headlines Ukrainians are calling their children javelin and javelina. I yes, it was just, yeah, some, uh, there's uh, some vehicles in here. And it, oh, and there's, uh, that's a 40 millimeter grenade launcher that we have. Tell me about the American. rifle, that almost, that looks ancient, oh. like a Mosin Nagan. Yeah, they got some, Ukrainian. oh, and if you look over there, you look in that far left corner right there. Um, far left corner? The Maxim, in... the fat Maxim, I didn't get the better picture of it, but you see that Maxim machine gun, the World War One. Oh, that's the World War One. They yeah, got, yeah, I mean, I think ancient. every Ukraine... Um, display is obligated to have that machine gun in it. I think it's, it's iconic. Uh, at the beginning of the war, we had those memes of people using it. But um, yeah, and then, oh, and so I wanted yeah, to point out this six. picture specifically because, you know, they, they were like, oh, slat armor is a cope cage. It doesn't work. And well, what the, what is that? It's a NATO vehicle, a British vehicle with a cope cage on it. Who would have covered with a cope cage? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then, um, there's what oh and there's the French. That's the French AMX. That was another game changing um, vehicle. A wheeled, uh, yes, the vehicle. wheel that goofy wheeled tank that France sent. And then uh, there's a oh so this is the M113. This is a tra you know just your uh, Vietnam era transport vehicle. And the next picture will show what these different calibers do. A 30 millimeter and that 12.7 is a 50 cal um, round. That's what they. That's what those do to it. And then there's, Jeez, and then there's looks another. Like and Mache, like yeah. That so there's bomb. an MRAP. That's an anti IED warfare vehicle that we used a lot in Afghanistan and Iraq. And then there's another one here after that. Um, oh, that's a Ukrainian BMP. And then there's another one. Just one specific. Okay, so this is what frat shrapnel will do to these vehicles. So I mean, I know it's a lot. And I showed this picture because there's. And, there's, and there were several, I saw several vehicles like this, you know, completely um, peripherated with shrapnel. Because there's that debate, you know, when you see these plumes, these dramatic plumes of smoke, and there's this debate, well, did that shell that struck close to a vehicle actually damage it? I mean, that's a debate that's been going on, but this kind of, I think, illustrates it. You know, that's, you, yes, you know, anything, most of these armored vehicles out there can get just turned into Swiss cheese by standard artillery. So that was the big, yes, that's basically it for... It looked like you picked a beautiful day to head out. Yes, it's a typical. It was about. I, I saw uh, a very blue sky. Sixteen. Well, it was about sixteen below that day Celsius. So, <laughs> is um, what it is here still, sadly. Yes. Look, um, compare that to um, there was this it, it, the amazing headlines in the West, but Putin uh, basically visited the Ural Wagon Zavod factory where all the T ninety mm -hmm. the, the tanks are made. And um, there was a huge amount of stress uh, in the NATO headlines, not just the space nukes, but I'm just going to, you know, uh, 
just read a couple of them. Like for, for Russia already claims that 15,000 tanks uh, have been uh, destroyed in this operation. That's from the Ministry of Defense. But here's Europe. Uh, the US, sorry, after Urawa Gons, Russia can withstand years of equipment losses at current levels. And those current levels are probably from the Ukrainian infantry numbers. The second one is from The Guardian, a lot higher than we expected. Russian arms reduction worries Europe's war planners, basically. Fi uh, Financial Times, London. The West has gone far enough in sanctioning, has not gone far enough. We cannot help Ukraine outproduce. Uh, Russia. So when the space nukes came out, and this is what I uh, also wanted to show you, just a couple of pictures, mostly exclusively from Russian accounts. Uh, this is what the Russians came up with, like uh, this is what the West fears. Shoigu's, um, what do you call oh, it? Oh, yes. Super, super, super mech. <laughs> then there's uh, Shoigu's <laughs> space washing machine. And uh, Shoigu built the Death Star. And I love that it's classic Soviet as well. But uh, yes. that, that's the, the kind of funny stuff they're making. Because let's not forget, this is the Munich Security Conference, where in most regards, this started. He's going there with a huge loss on his hands around Avdivka, including something that's only rumored by both sides, you know, that massive strike on, on a grouping. Uh, he's got no 60 billion from the US. I mean, what does he do? He, he, he slams like a Czech uh, MLRS into into innocent people in Belgorod once again. Uh, and that's it. He's got no fucking cards. And obviously, Navalny's wife is the other. Uh, he thinks an ace in the hole. It's, it's just so smells of desperation. You know? Well, didn't didn't um, the two British um, naval vessels uh, both broke down right one yes, after the yeah, other. One after the other. Yeah. Both aircraft carriers. They were yeah. supposed to take part in this largest NATO. Uh, yeah, and they both broke down. And a U.S. ship had to return to the U.S. because there were multiple problems. Uh, so we, you know, it, uh, it, it, and and you should read Cy Hirsch's column today about. Uh, oh, I missed the, that. Okay. The, the, the three Navy SEALs who died. Uh, the, oh, there's the, news on that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and you know, you have to read Hirsch with you know a certain perspective, but but he has reliable sources as far as it goes on certain topics, and and the real takeaway was uh, that that the military uh, sort of the the command structure, the the uh, officer class and is in woeful condition that that it, it's just an ineffective army now compared to what it was 30 years ago even. now just i'm sorry just to clarify are these the navy seals that got washed that allegedly got washed away during an anti-somalian pirate operation or is this a different group that I'm i yeah, think it's the three in tower 22 right in this uh, either syria or jordan is that the one john stepling no this is this is a uh, those were uh, soldiers they were re trying to refuel. Um, I don't know the, all the technical aspects of this, but the SEAL commander said, no, we can't go out. The seas are too rough. And he refused to send people out. And those above him said, you have to go out and do this. And they did. And they died um, because it was an impossible mission. Oh, this was and California, wasn't it? Uh, there's a, a chopper oh. went down. Maybe maybe this that's not it. Okay. There's a lot of Read these. The I don't know. I, I those were Marines. The helicopter yeah, I, crash from Marines. Okay. I, the Sorry, there's too many of these. Navy remember. SEALs were in the operation in the Red Sea, and then the Red three sea, guys right. at Tower 22. That was uh, regular regular Marines. Those were no, those were soldiers, and then so those Army, were soldiers. Army. Army soldiers, and then the Marines yeah. were in the helicopter crash. Now yeah, there yeah. are too uh, many to follow. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are training accidents that happen every year. I think there's more scrutiny on them. When I was um, going through training for a deployment to Kuwait in Fort Hood, Texas, there was a nasty where actually it was, wasn't our unit, but it was actually the guys training our unit who had a very unpleasant hard landing in a Black Hawk helicopter in Fort Hood, Texas that crashed and killed all of them, unfortunately. So th these accidents do happen. So I know there's a tendency to say, oh, no, 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 it's a conspiracy. They're covering up casualties in Ukraine now. Yeah. There are legitimate accidents that happen. We just up until yeah, now I mean, not paying I, attention yeah, to them. No doubt. Um, this just, the point I think Hirsch was making mm -hmm. was uh, the- It was the a training problem, problem that or a command problem. Mm -hmm. overriding the people um, 
who were on, you know, in the, the guy said, you should look out the window. The transfer was look out the window. You can see the seas are impossible to carry out any kind of uh, activity on. Wow. And, and so people had been writing to Lloyd Austin, apparently saying this commander should be brought up on charges and blah, blah, blah. But, Is he out of uh, hospital again? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Well, he has he has his deputy. Apparently, he's transitioned um, authority to his deputy true. because yeah, of true. his emergent um, bladder problems. That's the official word. Yes. Emergent. I hate when bladder problems are emergent. Uh, yeah, I. That's a whole separate, <laughs> very odd story. Um, I just have. I don't have a lot of time left, but I. I wanted to circle back. Um, something because Ben had brought it. I mean, two things. One is uh, the Tucker Carlson interview and and propaganda and uh, just more opinions about that because I'm, I'm really curious to, to sort of clock how that interview has been received by the public because I'm not reading anything about how many millions of people, 17 million people or something, watched this video? I'm not hearing what they thought about it in general. Uh, that's number one. And and two is uh, the LaRouche thing is a subject for um, a whole program. Yeah, true. Uh, I agree. I, I agree. It, it would be worth having because because it's it's one of those topics and realities that flies below the radar and uh there's a number of left writers who are associated with canadian universities i know and and um professors up there who seem great but you have that you read them and you I, start i've i've had it with left academics that's my current um, point of view. yeah really or know. yeah um yeah, uh, we could get into. Uh, I mean, I've had some shocks lately uh, on on the Hamas IDF front uh, with left academics that I would never have suspected. Uh, would You'd have close. a stroke just looking at the basic topics in Hungary and the the Academy of Sciences. It's absolutely foreign. Like it's it's taken. I'd like to comment on the uh, on the on the Putin Carlson interview. But first I want to make a minor point um, in case we have uh, somebody who's, who's a, a, a nitpicker. It, it's, it's um, Suhart. This guy that was elected in Indonesia is a, a Suharto clone, not a Sukarno clone. Suharto was the one who led the uh, slaughter of nearly a million people uh, right. with the central intelligence agency. In 65, 66, and in Bravo, Bravo, Subianto. I can't do better than that. That's, yeah, Subianto. That's, that's it. So, but, but I, I immediately after the interview, I immediately uh, went on to the Washington Post, which is our hometown newspaper, and there were there were several articles, and they were all vastly critical of of the interview. But I be I read several hundred of the comments, and virtually all of them, without exception. Uh, there was one uh, were very hostile toward the interview. Now, my wife pointed out that you know they they could be you know hired to to present you know the Washington Post has it could be serious money, but anyway, they were very very hostile toward Putin, but almost to the point of hysteria, and there was no context to their hysteria. It was it yeah. was empty. It was with it was like. The, the the fact that there was a Maidan coup in 2014 and a, no another coup actually in 2004, Putin said 2005, both involved Yanukovych. That there was a accords that was all new new apparently to these people. And they yeah. were Carlo, Carlo, quick question: Were they also hostile and angry at Tucker or just at Putin? They were or both, angry at both Tucker of them too. Yeah, for being a dupe and you know and. Yeah. Why do you think the Oliver Stone stuff is not coming up and being referenced in connection to this? No. It didn't get much play. Not many people know about it. 
Uh, they still have a lot of play. Ukraine on fire. I don't think it got really mainstreamed at all. I think HBO ran it, didn't they? I don't know. I think so. I think so. But that doesn't mean do, that yeah. it, you know been been put in everybody's mind. A lot of people have never even heard about it. I yeah, mean, a lot of no, I know. And so, so one takeaway then from this 17 million views of the Tucker Carlson interview is that. Tucker Carlson is a huge celebrity now. And so that's why people watched it. Um, <clears throat> because the, the Stone interview and film on Putin has been around for a number of years and nobody goes to see it. It's strange. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm thinking aloud because I'm trying to kind yeah. of untangle that. It's, it's surprising. Well, he, Not to uh, mention I mean, people let's... get things garbled. They, well, and they, and they, they don't remember and the, the relevance, like the relevance, because yeah. that was pr pr prior to the SMO, that was prior to, you know, getting closer to, uh, you know, World War Three. So now that we're a lot closer with, with everything that's happened, I think I think if Oliver Stone sat down with Putin, too, I think it would be much bigger than his documentary from several years ago. But, yeah, yeah. it's not really people like really wanting to seek out the truth, because if they really want to seek out the truth, I mean, it's available like they can find it. But yeah, right. uh, but I think this, if anything, yeah. is praise of uh, Oliver Stone, but he's more obscure than Tucker because Tucker has this story. Yeah, you know, he, sure. he was first like a uh, Republican then a, or a liberal, then a Republican. Then he got fired from Fox and went independent. Tucker on X interviewing interesting people. And then he made this big teaser of I'm going to Moscow and, and all of that. There was huge buzz around it. And to his credit, uh, Mr. Apartheid Minor, uh, what do you call it, uh, Elon Musk, didn't filter it. Yeah, uh, didn't filter the interview. Yeah, it actually pumped it right up. So there's it does, it does, the it does have a point here with his assertion that they're trying to push the idea that only the right wing wants to have peace with Russia. Is that maybe? Um, no, I, think I that's mean, ridiculous. It's, no, it's it's. So here's the thing about Tucker. So about Tucker. So I would say he is authentic, and a lot of blue collar people in red states and flyover country and the rest built really like him. And he does, I think, speak authentically, even if it's not always from the most, edu unfortunately, not always the most educated place he's talking from, but he does speak authentically. And the thing about Tucker, he's a California Democrat, you know, so it's interesting that now he's just a right wing extremist. He was never a yeah. right. He was always, I mean, 10 years ago, you've been kind of a center right figure. You know, just it shows how we've shifted. So as far as when he when Tucker himself, you know, he does. I think Tucker himself gets into the whole equivalating fascism and communism thing, as does Trump. But when yeah. I think somewhat when Tucker has does talk about the institutional left, I think is the word he call, he uses for it. I think that's accurate for what for the establishments that you have with the Democratic Party and um, that Biden. Biden administration represents, you know, that's that's the American left wing. That's the hegemonic American left wing. And we can say, oh, that's not the real left wing. That's or, you know, it's Thank in, if in the context of American politics, you know, the no true Scotsman fallacy isn't true. That is essentially what the institutional left, you know, love it or hate it. It is what the institutional left looks like in the U.S. I mean, it depends on how you define left. And that's a whole can of worms. But, well, I mean, yeah, it they, goes back. It goes back, back to the French Revolution, that. which side of the room you sat on. You know, it's right, and it's I don't. So, I wouldn't say the Democrats would be on the left side of that room, but in this country, they're called the left. So it's just, yeah. So are liberals in Europe, which have nothing to do with what used to be called the left. John, while well, I have you, I don't mean to muddy this topic, but I really want to show you something because you were basically um, my crystal ball on this. This appeared on the Hungarian Magyar Hirlap. It's it's kind of tabloidy, but in the middle. And I'm going to hit translate on this, and then you'll see it in English. And yeah, helps. <laughs> look at that. This was in Hungarian press. Some uh, like constitutional lawyer went through the constitution because someone requested that, uh, what do you call it? Kamala Harris should say Trump, uh, sorry, um, Biden, get out because you're, you have memory loss and I'll be the temporary president. And he, he went through the constitution saying, yeah, they're going to brush off Michelle Obama. So I wanted to say kudos to you for yeah, seeing this go. if it should happen. I wanted Step to show that. Sheets and scores. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I'm going to, I have to depart here momentarily, but uh, what Billy Bob said uh, about you know, Democrats on the left, only the stupidest 
uh, of liberals would think that. I I hear it too, though, and people still think that. Um, there's all these 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 kind of weird uh, generalizations that go on out there. It, it, one is conflating fascism and communism. One is thinking that Klaus Schwab and World Economic Forum and people that meet at Davos are climate communists or something, whatever that means. Kamal um, is a Marxist, just so you, you know. know. And 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 there because people have not read Marx. Also, sub bar, sub sidebar, uh, you find endless numbers of anti Marx articles now in media. It's just a phenomenon. But yeah, anyway, preemptive. people are not, yeah, people are not educated in, in this area, and language is deteriorated, education is deteriorated. And so it's very, very difficult to, in any kind of coherent fashion, engage with people that are are kind of politically immature in this way because they don't they, they have no um no consistent reference points that 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 you can work with and and class being billy Rob was quite right the foremost problem in all of this because this is this people have said to me can you explain communism and as soon as you get to class they're like, what? Wait, what do you, you know? What is that? What? Yeah, and and it's so it's very hard. All of it is very hard, and I think it's this is this is what we should all be doing in some way. It's what um, our group tries to do and hopes to do more. Is is have like the alternative university, the people's university, and that's I guess what these podcasts are too that, that we're doing is is an attempt to elucidate these these things for for more and more people in some fashion or other and um i i i feel it's this is the only kind of hope in a sense because um you know if if one trusts the 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 system at all you were you were going to go crazy and you are you were going to imprison yourself ultimately it's it's hopeless and um okay my so axel and your other son axel and alfred they're alfred. the twins yeah they, they need your attention john thank you yeah. so much i'm gonna remove my you. pleasure guys thank okay, you See you, see you we'll, we'll talk about LaRouche. All right, all right. Another Sorry, time. I, I bumped him out too quick. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was, I, I love John's words there, uh, especially when he says I'm right. I love to hear that, especially. Yeah. <laughs> um, Can I share no, a quick he, anecdote? Just right. It's, it's an issue, and I don't know how to address that issue other than to do things like this. And, you know, I think we just have to use those avenues that are available to us to try and help a public, a general public that it's, they're just uh, the we're, not gonna get, we're not going to get Michelle Obama as president. Here's, not, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Well, that, that was just I mean, something that's personal to John because that was one of his. Yeah, that was one of his. And, and you might, I mean, you could be right. What what, what do we think is going to happen? I mean, do we want to uh, prognosticate here? Like, I don't know what yeah. they're going to do. Biden Before, is, if, if you want to talk elections, I, let's do it. Before that, can I do a quick anecdote? Okay. Just, just yes. a yeah. sort of yeah, yeah. Eastern European uh, thing that um, what uh, John said was the foundations, as in class, were sort of confused away. Uh, and I think that's very true, uh, especially in Europe where we had communism. But, And I'm not going to piss on New Zealanders per se, uh, who pick them out, because I think it's the same in maybe Norway and maybe America. But I was walking the street back when I lived there, and a little kid said to mom, what's communism? I said, don't you remember Animal Farm? It's when someone else tells you what to do. And I think that is the completion of their studies uh, of what communism is. Uh, you can tell me if you're wrong. But for there, it hasn't been confused away. It hasn't been obscured from history like it has here. It's just never, ever been introduced. And I think that means the U.S. and these Western states, they, they face a whole a larger hill, a larger obstacle uh, to actually get to uh, you know, a proper working uh, political theory than we because do. of the backwardsness of the um you know the mass psychology yeah. you know? it's yeah. animal farm that's that's communism that's yeah that's kindergarten level you know yeah biden okay he's, he's go, there's go, nothing Cardo. there the man's gone he's gone it's, it's just I ridiculous mean, 
you know, I'm an old man. I, I can tell when other old people are losing and I'm around them sometimes, you know, it's, it's terrible, but so so what are they gonna do? Yeah. They're in a spot, Carlo. They are We're, in a spot. It's too late to bring somebody else into the into the mix. Other I than Kamala. So but Kamala be- everybody in America, I hope, would hate Kamala. I mean, come on. They they do. She's oh, got she negative charisma, no brain. History is are, historic. Are they gonna do weekend at Biden's until the election and then he'll just drop out after week one? And and she'll be no. She'll be I think they're going to keep, because it's just it's they're having the time of their lives. The Anthony Blinkens and Austins and everybody can do whatever the hell they want. They're like their own little fiefdoms. There's no is it, there's no one telling them what to do. They can do whatever the the, the the perpetual deep state can do whatever the hell they want. There's no one even pretending to rein them in. I mean, do you remember? I mean, there was a video like within the first week. Of Biden, I mean, of Biden taking office. This is kind of a farcical tradition for us, but it's a tradition where you know you have the pres- the new president sit at the desk and he signs a bunch of executive orders that pretty much repeal everything the previous presidents did. It's like an American tradition at this point. And at one point, he was like, "I don't even know what I'm signing." He's just he actually says it out loud. It's like, I, it's like he, they, you know, <laughs> here's the difference between four years. He was inaugurated with Lady Gaga being a big splash, wearing a blue dress, right? Then he got into mm-hmm. office. And now pretty much all the press is about that fucking Taylor Swift is going to swing the election. That's like mm-hmm. well, that's big. That's, that's big. I mean, you know, you remember all those meetings during the whole Thanks, COVID thing where um, Biden would have these Oval Office meetings with the big TikTok influencers in the country. Jesus. That's the, the thing fuck- he did. And they did it for Ukraine too. I mean, it's just like, oh, you know, here's the message that we want all these influencers, the TikTok people, to do. You know, they, it's just, and I wouldn't even say it's um, it's a dumb strategy. It's just like if you're just it's going to go for the lowest common denominator. Okay, so, so Ian, uh, uh, given uh, headline given your- from the Hill, and, and you're next, okay. I promise, Billy Bob. Democrats oh, yeah. unveil new hip hop task force to tackle racial inequality. That is su- such the hip hop task head. force. Yes, the private the sector. Task- Unleash the hip hop task force. So, how long will Biden um, remain in office? Like, is he going to manage through the election? And then, if so, how long into his four year term? And then, who will come after? I mean, just we're just guessing here. Yeah, I think, think. Well, I think they're going to, I mean, as long as he doesn't die, I yeah. think fall, he's fall gonna, over I in think the shower. Yeah. And, yeah. If he doesn't, if he doesn't die and he you know they'll keep him in and they'll try to get him reelected and keep him in another four years i think i see no evidence that that's not the plan at this weekend at biden's and he can last another four i i think ian makes good point this is sarcastic and i'm making a joke but someone said uh he might collapse on stage and people will still scream you know four more years yeah, it, it, he could die on stage. It's it's. Well, Carlos said what Carlos said. You're right. If their plan was to replace him, they would have done it already. It's too late at this point. They already kind of um, got behind him. You know, there's no primary to get to go after a, a serious Democratic candidate. I think I don't know what their plan is for beating Trump. I think maybe they're doing a hail mary to hope they can just keep Trump off the ballot, but. Um, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm, I, I, I just with... know how they work in narratives and they work in, um, you know, things. So I'm just waiting for the next big thing to happen, the next justification for something, because they're going to, you know, they're going to come out with a story and it's going to be OK, because of this, we have to do this. And it's going to involve um, the, you know, the election and the president, the Democratic candidate. But uh, maybe not, you know, maybe uh, I'm with, uh, I recently watched a Mark Sloboda short, I think with DD Geopolitics, Sarah, she's amazing. And he's, I, I know you think I support Trump than you guys do. I, I hate him. Uh, I th- think equally as you guys do, but uh, Mark called him the, the chaos bomb. You don't know how, how far, <laughs> it's not good news for you. It's not good news for me, but he could be the bomb to fucking blow this shit apart. You know, yeah, the yeah, same I, reason I, I support <laughs> Ursula for NATO. <laughs> But, you know, with um, with what Putin said, you know, that Biden's more predictable, I think in a sense he's, I mean, it was half a joke, but half not a joke. Because with oh. Biden, he's representing 
the establishment, you know, they put that chip in his brain and tell him what to say. He reads off the teleprompter. You know, that's what the establishment is thinking. Which you're, we don't even know what he's going to do with the Ukraine. It's like he contradicts himself every other week on it. You know, it's like it's either, oh, I would and I would negotiate a peace or I would do a better job of arming Ukraine so they would win. It's like, well, which is it? You know, he, who freaking knows what you I think from a, the perspective of other world leaders with Trump is just like, who do you, who knows? Um, Chaos bomb. It's a chaos bomb. Please. But I don't but I think ultimately what Putin said in that same interview is that you know they'll respect whoever the president of the USA is. I think that's ultimately the Russian position. It's Repu Russians, you know, ask me, they, they just say to me, I can't even tell the difference between Republicans and Democrats. They seem like the same. <laughs> so, so they're there's... they're not gonna determine an actual US president who's in exile that they're gonna go ahead and try and work with. Uh, like we well, did of course, the, of course. Well, no. Putin is just going to push a button at his desk, and that's the person who wins the U.S. election. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, he, um, he controls so much of this world. He controls everything except Russia, because you know this guy in jail was in danger of overthrowing it. So you know, it's just. <laughs> well, what Ben described is um, is uh, Steve Bannon's plan to bring chaos to the U.S. and 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 and, and around the world, if possible. I mean, that's that's what he sees as the future. Um, he sees uh, that uh, uh, that he, if he can bring everything down, it will fall. What's left will fall into his lap. Just the why are they his, united against him if he's the control opposition? Yeah, his is uh, his, his every his, level. Well, but but again, but again, if they're united against him, how could he possibly win the election? Why don't they just put him in prison? So that's that's a question I have. Like, if they're united against him, like this isn't no democracy. I, I didn't mean that YouTube. I, I, I meant, but I meant YouTube. Um, never mind. Well, here's the big so, thing. Here's but, the big thing. But so. they, they seem generally scared that he can win, which is kind of surprising to me because I think they control the the outcomes. But and then they're trying to kind of Trump proofing it. Like they're kind of you know they're putting in this legislation yep. that says, okay, if Trump wins, he won't be able to undo this. Which or, is or quit NATO. That, you know, yeah, we, we don't like democracy. We're going to not let the voters have a choice. It's kind of is basically what that that is. Yeah. But with the big thing is though with Ukraine. So it's just like if they screw around with the bill. I mean, there's a chance. I think we have to accept there's a chance this just won't get passed at all. And then the question is, how long? What does Ukraine have left in the stockpile that they can just cling on by their fingertips? Because you know, if because I did say that I was sure the plan was to keep this game going till after the election. You know, wind it down in spring and summer of 2025, like they did with Afghanistan, because that was a bipartisan decision. That was an establishment decision to get out of. F even though Trump took all the credit for it, tried to take all the credit for it, they were like, "Okay, that we're was done." Biden. We're going to pivot. We are well because Trump made the deal. You know that art of the deal that Trump loves to talk about. It's just you like wanna, you want to go. But the problem with Ukraine is that if they don't get money there soon, I mean, it's, we're not even talking about the military side. Just their economy will collapse at some point, and it's really hard to oh, get yeah, this. Nobody it's gets bad. paid. Yeah. Everybody. Uh, you know. No, I mean, I see collapse. stories saying the soldiers aren't getting paid now. Yeah. I mean, like Ben, last podcast, you mentioned uh, the Dragon's Teeth story. You can't even pay for new images. Mean, it's, it's bad. So it's just like, how long is that going to go if they don't get? And the, and the, and now, Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, but the European aid package, that's over four years, and they haven't even dispersed that. They don't even know where it's going to come from. Am I right? And it's not, oh, no, sorry, it's not nothing, but 50 billion euros over, over four, four years. Over four years. Whereas the, oh, which is, I, I mixed them up. Maybe Melnik uh, said, well, we need 120 billion euros each year or something like that. It's, it's a drop in a, 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 a bottomless bucket, you know? Like they're already dissatisfied uh, with that, and now the U.S. sixty is gone. So this is uh, it's speeding up so and fast. Push uh, fortifications. They have. It's just like you have where a, are they going to fall back to? It's going to be ugly. How close to the election are they going to want a big military collapse in Ukraine to happen? Because it's, I think at this point, if they don't get new money, I mean, it's going to happen before the election. Yeah, I mean, sure. Ian, I hope well, there was a big lag, but. Uh, they didn't build like a Surovikin level line, I don't think. Well, how, how how long ago did they start building that? 
I, I don't think they have anything close to the, those types of layered fortifications that could actually. Yeah, withstand. so you're you're alluding to the possibility of you know a, a real large amount of movement on the front, you know, heading west, and that that could ve Pullback very position. well be a possibility. Um, I mean, you know, we've speculated about that since the very beginning of the SMO. So I mean, um, time will tell. We have been going about an hour and a half. Uh, we have one of our largest uh, live view, 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 oh. view, viewing audiences ever. So I just want to thank everybody for watching us live. Um, and I was going to wind it up because uh, it's like, yeah, yeah, at an hour and a half now. Um, any, any final thoughts before we say uh, goodbye? I'll, and go I'll ask everyone, maybe Ian as well, if you want to share this one picture. It's obviously unverified, uh, but it's going around social media. And apparently this is the the party card, the membership of Mr. Zaluzhny joining the Poroshenko, the Chocolate Kings, uh, what is it, European Solidarity or something? Yeah, his party. European so Solidarity. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, you know, that that's interesting because they can't stand Zelensky, neither can Poroshenko, neither can Klitschko, who's a member of this party. So it might so that be was, that. Yeah, this... that was February 12th. His ID is dated February 12th. So that's no, true, true, but this is going around social media now. I can't see any uh, obvious signs of meddling, but it could still be a fake, you know. It's just an interesting aspect now that he's not at home. He's in Germany right now signing uh, some sort of exclusive safety agreement there like he did with uh, Rishi Sunak. And then off to Munich, basically. My guess is Poroshenko would be a little bit more fascisty than... The a chocolate king. king, yeah. But... So I'm not sure. Yeah, they might be a worse a worse team than than Zelensky. But uh, you know, I guess time will tell. Maybe maybe they'll run on a platform of friends with Russia and better relations. Who knows? The new Arestovich program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hear Slug. Uh, Spaz is probably over there somewhere. Yes. yes. Um, uh, that wasn't from my side. Slug's right here, but she's quiet. Okay. Yeah, he's here. You can hear his feet pattering on the floor. He's. Thank you very much, everyone. For, for joining the roundtable. Thank you, everyone, for watching. We will be back uh, probably Tuesday. So we will see you then. Thank you.